I'm so, so thankful for our panelists today. We have three wonderful panelists. Uh, we have Professor Volpe, of course, from IU, which many of you know very well. Um, professionally world-renowned singer, fantastic singer. We have um, Catherine Sansoni. She is the Dean of Students at Aspen Music Festival and School. She'll be talking about that, of course, um, a singer herself. And then we have Luke Hausner. And Luke is a coach in Philadelphia and runs his own Young Artist Program, as well as uh, several other roles that he's working in. So we have three amazing uh, panelists. I'm going to let them introduce themselves further. Uh, I just wanted to say on behalf of the Office of Entrepreneurship and Career Development, I'm the engagement specialist with them, engagement specialist with them and um, I'm so thankful that we could, we could have the three of you here tonight to talk about YEPs. Um, so what I'd love to do to start is I'm going to have each of you just for a couple minutes um, share about yourself and the program you work for. And if you wouldn't mind actually just sharing like one or two things that are a major benefit um, as a part of your program. So I'd love to start with Katie and then we can move to uh, uh, Luke and then Professor Volpe. Thank you, Spencer. Um, and it's great to see everybody here. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Katie Sansoni. As Spencer said, I'm the Dean of Students at the Aspen Music Festival and School. We are, um, as many of you know, a large summer festival. We bring about 650 students every summer um, and within that program, we have the Aspen Opera Theater and Vocal Arts Program. It's been newly constructed um, with Renee Fleming and Patrick Summers at the helm. Um, and then we have amazing faculty as well, including your own Carol Vaness, um, Vincent Cole, and um, a new to be determined um, faculty member as well as Elizabeth Hines, um, sadly, but understandably just retire to spend more time with family in the summers. Um, things that make our program special, um, I'm gonna do the thing and name drop and that is <laughs> that's because of Renee and Patrick. Um, we are very excited to have them participating in this program and bringing their vision to what was already a really successful um, summer young artist program. Um, their vision for the program is a an educational environment in a professional setting that can help um, students become a more well-rounded musician. So not coming in to sing the one role that by Mozart that you think you need to sing, um, but to come in and learn about cabaret and to learn about musical theater and, um, and really prepare for, again, um, uh, the future of vocal artistry. Right, um, and this idea that um, students are not going to go to undergrad, go to grad, get a young artist program gig, get the next level young artist program gig, and then sing in all the big houses. That's not going to be the norm as our industry changes and we have more and more talented singers. So the goal at the Aspen Music Festival is to help prepare you for what that world is looking like. Um, yeah, that's my spiel. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I guess I'm up. Uh, again, Spencer, thank you for having me tonight and joining these panelists and the students. My name is Luke Hausner. Um, I've been based the last 25 years uh, in Philadelphia at the Academy of Vocal Arts. Um, and the reason I started these workshops, I'm on the opposite uh, end of the spectrum as far as size, as a uh, establishment such as Aspen. But over the last 25 years at at AVA, every March, you know, we have about 100, 200 singers audition for us. And as I've looked at their resumes over the years, I've noticed a very sharp decline in the number of full roles coached on singers' resumes, just gradually over, you know, over time. And so I started these workshops 13 years ago. They are short, only two weeks a piece, and the goal is to, to uh, give singers a chance to coach a full role and perform it, not just coach it, but perform it in a short but intensive time period. Um, I started off uh, these workshops in Vancouver and Toronto and gradually expanded to Portland. Pre-COVID, uh, the last city, I, I was actually in Bloomington for six summers over at First United near the mall on Third oh, yeah. There's a nice space and it still it's is, wonderful space. space, yeah. Um, so uh, pre-COVID, 
uh, the four cities I offer these workshops are in Portland, Oregon, places we like to visit to in the summer to escape New Jersey. You could understand that. <laughs> uh, Austin, Texas, Minneapolis, and Bloomington. Last summer, due to COVID, obviously, I moved everything online. And the same thing uh, will be for this summer. Everything is online. I do offer, as far as repertoire, I offer Ruzalka in Czech. It's a nice intro to Czech for many singers. Um, flute and Hansel and Gretel in German. And then the fourth opera rotates between Cosi, Figaro, and Giovanni. Um, this summer, I occasionally offer Outliers. And again, since I'm online, versus instead of tackling a, a, one of the Mozart rested operas, I'm doing Rheingold, just because I love the piece. So there's something a little bit different. Um, I have, as far as, yeah, I'm trying to think what else I could we'll follow up later. But uh, that's just there a little will, intro. There will be so many questions to, to continue that conversation. Thank you so much. That, that, that all sounds wonderful. Uh, Professor Volpe. Thank you. And Spencer, thank you for that introduction. I don't think I need to add to it. Thank you very much. Um, as most of you know, and if you don't, I'm here as an associate professor voice on the faculty of uh, Jacob School of Music. And uh, I was very fortunate to have led a very long career as a professional basso in the business, and I'm still leading it. And I'm very grateful to the university to let me out and sing once or twice a year. And I like to keep my toes in my career for a couple of reasons. A, I still enjoy it and I'm still capable, thank, not wood, thank God. B, the income is still very good. And C, and most importantly, truly, it, it gives me a bridge between the university setting and the professional world through which I can help my students, not only mine, but any other students that come to me for help. I have um, still a great deal of contact to a lot of the regional con companies and some of the big ones yet. And um, I like to keep those venues exercised so I can still have communication for the singers that come to me for help and um, for placement. So I like to try and exercise that and make suggestions with companies. With regard to summer program, the summer program I'm involved with, is something I helped to co-develop and ideate. It's called Opera Luca, and it's a summer festival in Luca, Italy. It is one month. And um, I think apart from a lot of the other um, programs in the world or the United States, one of the things that I think set, does set Opera Luca apart is uh, when I was designing it with my colleagues, I have two colleagues that worked on this. I wanted to design it around um, the language. So the students at Opera Luca get 40 hours of Italian. And they, they go to Italian school from 9 a.m. to 1 a.m. before we even sing or touch music or have any lessons or coachings. Uh, one of the most important things I think for young singers is to be consummate in their language abilities. And one of the weaknesses I've seen in a lot of the young artist programs in the United States was that, uh, regrettably, the language skills were kind of wanting. So I wanted to help develop this program, not only for singing and music, but uh, really to help singers further their excellence in Italian. So they get five hours each day. And at the end of the month, it's 40 hours of Italian. And it's really quite a bit. So that's the first thing that's great about it. And the second thing is it's in Italy. So it's pretty great. <laughs> it's beautiful and it's lovely. And there's really nothing more to say. It's a lovely setting. It's a great summer. It's one month and it's Luca is one hour from Florence. It's a couple of hours from Venice. It's easy travel. So it's really attractive to be there and the people are friendly and you get to use your language skills throughout the month. We make sure we push you into the piazzas and use your skills that you're learning. Beyond that, it's the same. We, we um, cast for operas. We're trying to get our funding together to, to create an orchestra. It is a new program. Regrettably, we have had to cancel last year and this year as well. We made the decision a couple of months ago to cancel because I just didn't think, you know, even teaching this year, uh, even though I've 
chosen to teach in my studio uh, with masks and all the proper precautions. It's just, I thought it would have been unhappy to invite people for full tuition or whatever it is they could afford to pay uh, to come and spend an entire summer in the mask in a foreign country. Not to mention, I don't think travel would have been possible this summer anyway. So it's turning out to be a, a good decision. Beyond that, we offer quite a bit of things and I'd be happy to answer any questions that are gonna ensue. Fantastic. Mm. Oh my gosh, three amazing uh, introductions there. So I, here's, here's how this is gonna work. Everyone that is here as a participant, if you have a question you wanna ask one of the panelists or just the panelists in general, please message me and I will, uh, and, and actually message me with your question and say if you'd like to say it in person or if you'd rather me ask it, and then we'll, we'll go that route. So for the first 15, 20-ish uh, 15, minutes, we're going to talk specifically about the three programs that you represent, and then we'll get into another uh, section where we start talking about programs in general, applying for programs. Um, so I have some questions prepared while I'm waiting for people to come up with their questions. Um, so... I met with some undergraduate students here at IU because we have, I, I think because we have such a great graduate program, people forget that we have amazing undergrads. Um, and one question that I was asked to ask was, when I'm applying for a young artist program, what sets me apart? And this, this can be anybody, uh, feel free to jump on it. What sets me apart? What sets my application apart? What, what are you looking for? Go ahead, Luke. I'll follow you. Yeah, I would say um, presentation. I know it's, this field sounds very obvious, but just how you present yourselves and um, also, well, <laughs> awareness of what's on the page. Another thing that sounds very obvious, but in the in a in a way, um, you know, look at to see what the composer gave you. Um, from playing auditions all these years, and even you know the kids I work with at ABA, all we're what we're doing every day is, you know, making them aware of what the, of what the composer gave us, and bringing those things to light, and then of course making it your own, <laughs> um, but just awareness, I would say, um, instead of, you know, if I'm play, if I'm playing for someone and I look at the page and they cross, you know, put on, on your Puccini score that. Like, I'll just cross off that forte, put a pianissimo. Just <laughs> maybe that's a little bit too much making it your own. But just, you know, see what the composer gave you. And then there's a lot there on the page um, to present. That the, the whole is clues. Fantastic. I second that completely. Um, and to tag on to that, it, the repertoire that you choose is very important. Um, and so, when you think about all these audition panels that are listening to people for hours and hours on end or listening to the same recordings over and over, there comes a time when they've heard the same aria from the same group of sopranos. Sorry to pick on y'all, but you know, there's more of you and you tend to sing the same 10 arias and the panelists get tired of hearing that. Even if it's you know, done really well, but if you can find something that sets you apart when it comes to your repertoire choices, that shows um, who you are as a musician, as Luke was saying, um, something that you can really connect with and something that you can bring to life in your audition is important. Um, and at the music festival, now Renee and Patrick are looking for a repertoire list that's, that's not the norm that has some cabaret, that has some musical theater or American songbook or, um, you know, Patrick loves talking about works that are written during your lifetime. And if any of you have ever heard me talk about our audition requirements at the festival, that's actually something I have to explain to singers often that your lifetime means think about the year you were born and then anything after that. Um, so again, it's, it's a repertoire list that you bring in or now they see online and they say, oh, wow, they're singing that piece. That's amazing. I haven't heard that all day today. And they'll remember it. Now you have to sing it well. And if your best aria ever is the most popular aria for your voice type,
but you just rock that thing, then you should sing it. So the first requirement is it's the best for you where you are in your training right now. But the second piece is if you can find repertoire that that pulls someone out, even just uh, even just one of your three to ten pieces, um, that would that would create a memory. I agree with that. I do. It's agreeing with my colleagues that um, we do hear a lot of auditions. And when we're looking for something, we, we, we're trying to find what is setting yourselves apart. This is your identification as yourself telling us this is my best. So, you know, if you have your three arias or your five, we're going to think that you identify yourself in this way as these are my best pieces. So if you're going to choose the standard rep, try to outsing the rest of the people that are going to be singing these pieces or find an aria from Maria de Rowan or something like this or and make it your own. We're looking for a personality. We hear your heart and your music. We're certainly going to listen to your instrument and hope it's, you know, of a caliber that is trainable and um that's something that could be marketable later. We understand that you're all young singers and you're still training, you know? So we are gonna look for certain, a certain technical aptitude as well. We certainly don't expect perfection, neither in your musicality, nor your languages, nor your technique, but we will identify how weak you are and how much help we think we can offer you or how much work there is realize you're going to be competing against many, many, many applicants. And as my colleagues um, told you, find something that you could make your own or put your label on. We'll see it, we'll hear it, you know, and we'll see in your personalities what music or what pieces excite you, you know? So try to identify yourselves personally and show it to us and we will notice. I think really? I think great they, answers, and I think it's funny that they're all so on point. Oh, I'm sorry, Luke, were you going to say I'm something? Sorry, I was just going to add, um, sincerity will go far. It and will. It, it, yeah, it's, it don't, will. don't just be worried about your technique, worry about that high note. Think right. about your text, about your character. It will come through, and it, it will, will, it will make you stand apart. It will. Yeah. It will. That was, yeah, that was a, I don't know if I was expecting the, the, the conversation of that question to be like a homogenous uh, <laughs> three-edged three sword, but that was fantastic. Um, I'm getting some more questions. I actually got a question from a, um, a student before your responses began talking about repertoire. And their question was, how do I pick repertoire you know, for auditions basically? And then I got another one. I'm gonna kind of, kind of, kind of combine the two questions. Um, Logan asked, uh, so if, if we're looking for something that's different, uh, how far is too far apart? It, you know, if somebody's familiar with the composer or the style, you know, is that suitable enough or is it something that we need to be familiar with as a judge or a, a reviewer? I think that depends a little bit on where you're auditioning. Um, you know, and so I would recommend doing a little bit of research and digging in, asking around, talking to people that have been to the program, um, talking to your teacher about who do you know there, what are they looking for, right? I can answer that question very specifically for our program, and I would say I don't think there is anything too far when it comes to, say, contemporary repertoire that would throw Renee or Patrick off. But that might not be the case for another program that doesn't focus on that type of repertoire. So I think that's that's not a great answer. I'm not giving you any helpful information other than do your own research. Um, but I, I would say start reaching out and um, you know a place like Aspen, you can email the administration and say, do you have any guidelines or recommendations or um, or additional information that would be helpful as I choose my repertoire. Um, or you can ask your teacher to reach out to one of their colleagues. And I, and um, Peter and Luke can talk to this more, but I would also highly recommend working with your teacher and your coach on your repertoire list. It has to come, I would suggest you start the conversation of here's some things I'm thinking, but they need to sign off. They know your voice. Yes. 
better than anybody. And they're, they're the ones guiding you through this, um, through the beginning of your career. This is a little segue. Um, as far as crafting your, your ever-changing ARIA list, um, mm -hmm. it will probably change by the day or by the hour. But ideally, you have, uh, you know, you're working on seven to eight instead of just five. I know this is, you know, it's an ideal world, but if you have a seven or eight that are up and running and presentable, then you could, you know, you could shift your, your five depending on the audition slash competition and, and cater it to whatever organization you're auditioning for um, out, of the, out of those seven or eight. But, but nothing is, you know, we, we, you all change. The voice is gonna be changing as you mature. And so uh, also make sure that I, ideally it's all within, I mean, I'm all for healthy stretches, but make sure we've seen lists that are all over the board. I'm sure you have as well. So try to kind of, I don't know if the word homogenize it right, but just within the same ballpark, even if some things are on the fringe, but not like, you know, three different Fach, obviously. <laughs> we, we like to hear things that you're capable of, and then maybe two on the list where you think your voice is going, mm -hmm. you know, and we're gonna make room for that. But the, the list, as Luke mentioned, can't be vast. It can't be too far apart from where you're going or where we think you might be going or what you're after. You know, if you're a bel canto singer, then sing some bel canto and then add some bigger bel canto that your teacher says, well, it might not be good for you now, but maybe Casta Diva will be something you can sing when you're 35 and be very well capable of. So if you do a, a, a good job of it, we'll understand that's where you're going. Try to ident identify yourselves. You know, um, it, it's not good to be pigeonholed, but you know, it's like shopping for clothes. You know, you're gonna go to the section of the clothes that fit you on the rack. You know, you're not gonna try on a, a 38 suit jacket if you're a 46, you know? Color is a different thing, but try to at least get it into you know, a parameter of what you, you're capable of doing and then might be even more capable of doing in a, after some good tutelage and some maturity. And we'll understand that you have an idea about yourself and what you're doing and where you're headed. And that we find. Hey, uh, I'm a 46 long in case anyone was wondering if they're ordering me as a suit. Uh, <laughs> I like blue, I like red. So I, I have a feeling we're gonna get back to repertoire. Somebody's gonna ask something. Um, we have a question that Caroline would like to come on and ask, so I'm going to let her do that. Yeah, hey, thanks so much for being here, panelists. This is really great. Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Hausner, unfortunately, I'm not super familiar with your workshops, and I was just doing a little Googling to try to learn more, but I was wondering if you could kind of give a little more detail um, about how your audition process works and like how that's working this year, if it's already over. Just sure. Um, well, probably you, you realize from Googling, that most of my publicity is by word of mouth. So, um, on that, but at the same time, last, last summer with the first COVID summer online, I had about 95 slots filled. This summer, I already have, already have, already have over 100. So I do start in October uh, and things gently roll. Obviously, especially with COVID, other programs, YAPS for this coming summer, they notify, I mean, even when things were in person, they notify all across the map, you know, any, any time from fall to all the way late spring. So singers are usually handcuffed as far as, you know, when they can sign up for things or they just need to wait. So I basically start in October and um, singers send me the materials. I, um, I will chat with the singer and their voice teacher. The voice teacher is involved, <laughs> if you're not. Um, so we have a three-way conversation about which roles may be best fit for where you are in your studies. Um, I will present you with the offer for the role and then the offer is good up until the role fills. So it is a you snooze, you lose type a little bit because you know, it's just every si singer situation is different as far as other, you know, eggs in other baskets as far as what the programs are applying to. So um, yeah, I have, I think I have four female slots left for the whole summer out of four operas and about 80 something slots. So of course the women 
roll still first. Space baritones, plenty of space. Come on down. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. We'll we'll probably get back to that too. Um, somebody might have another question that's similar. Uh, uh, Ashlyn wanted to ask, um, and we're we're going to talk about auditions in general during the pandemic, but. Uh, I'll direct this one to you, Professor Volpe. It doesn't have a specific program, but let's say you're reviewing resumes um, for your program. What are you looking for in a resume? Oh, well, not a whole heck of a lot. Uh, you know, it's a resume is, it, listen, it's a young artist program. So I'm not going to look at resumes and go, oh, they didn't do this and they didn't do that. They're not worthy. That's <laughs> silly to me. So I, you know, I don't really look at resumes so much we you know i think we ask for a short letter of you know self description and goals so it's the program i run is specifically designed for young singers i don't expect a resume out of it i'm hoping that i could add to your resume by you know casting you in certain roles of the operas that we do that summer or or um concert work we do both you know so specifically i i don't really consider resumes from college students um katie would, would, did you want to jump on that i know i've i should mention too i've been an aspen uh, student twice and i love it um and the last time when renee and patrick have taken over it's it's a whole new thing i mean there's a cv and a, it's, it's you know it's a bigger bigger build as far as paperwork and everything what what do you look for in a resume so it it I'll say like as a just overall, just when it comes to young artist programs, it depends on the program. So if it's um, a, a program like Peter was talking about, and it's more about the training aspect and building your experience, um, the resume is not going to be a huge piece to the puzzle. Um, for Aspen, we have two levels. I probably should have said this at the beginning. Um, we have studio artists and we have Fleming artists. We bring in about 15-ish Fleming artists every summer now, um, and they are singing principal roles, and they are really kind of handpicked by Renee, specifically with Patrick's support. Um, those singers, you know, this summer we're doing Magic Flute. The One of the Fleming artists is Pamina. Another one is Tamino, right? So it's, um, though we don't go off that completely. We had a couple of really talented young singers that um, Renee and Patrick were excited to work with, and we didn't have huge roles for them because they may not have been ready to sing something like Pamina, but they wanted to name them Fleming artists. We then have studio artists, and they're all levels that come in through that um, part of the program, and everyone's integrated. It's really like a naming type piece, not uh, the experience that you get. Um, and studio artists, are are singing co cover roles, some principal roles. Um, that's what Spencer would have been doing last summer if he were with us, singing a larger role um, and coming on a special New Horizons fellowship, which was again specially named by Renee and Patrick. Um, so studio artists um, come in on a different level of scholarship. Um, and so when we look at the two, um, I would say with Fleming artists, we do look at that resume. Um, and we almost look at that first because we're expecting a certain level of experience coming in that we don't have time with the Fleming artists contingent to, to prepare and train for. So we are looking for someone who has sung a principal role. We're looking for someone who um, has done other young artist programs. Um, we So we do look through that information and I'd say that you know, the top piece is what roles have you done, but also where have you done them? That's an important piece, you know, who has guided you through that role. Um, and then we look at the coaches and the faculty that you work with, the uh, private instructors. Um, Patrick really loves repertoire lists. I can't believe he looks through all of them, honestly, but I'm just telling you he does. And that seems very time consuming to me. But when it comes to studio artists, we skim that information I would say actually more so the rep list than the um, resume because we're expecting people come in at all different levels. Someone might have done three young artist programs and they're coming as a New Horizons fellow to sing um, second, second Armored Guard or something. But um, we might also have someone who's an undergrad, a senior at Juilliard would be an example that we had um, for last summer, who's done a couple smaller roles, done a ton of scene work, 
um, and vocally we're just really excited to work with. So again, I think it um, it depends on what you're looking at. You know, somewhere like HGO, somewhere somewhere like Kansas City, those programs are they're going to look at your resume and make sure that you can hack it when it comes to showing up and being thrown a ton of work. Mm. So, um, so start building on those programs and those experiences. Thank you for that answer. Um, yeah, I, I met Aspen. I wish I were there. Um, okay, Emily wants to come on and ask a question to you, Luke. Hello, um, Professor Hausner. I was just wondering um, how you would recommend larger or heavier voices um, approach choosing repertoire for auditions and how to balance age appropriate material and voice appropriate material for like dramatic voices. Well, um, as far as does, as far as my workshops go, that's why I do offer something like a Rusalka or a Ryan Gold, something uh, that would offer young singers a chance to be healthily stretched in a safe environment that's just with piano um, and to try things on. Um, as far as looking at auditions uh, outside of my workshops, uh, 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 something like at AVA, Again, I'm all, I think we're all for healthy stretches. It's important just to piggyback on something we were talking about earlier as far as crafting your list is not only contrasting um, composers, compos you know, time periods, but also um, tempi. I can't tell you how many times I look at an audition list and everything is andante and slower. <laughs> so as, as find at least something, one thing that moves the voice be it even if it's something like a chardosh or something like that, that is, you know, hard, but good hard. Um, um, what else can I tell you here as far as, you know, yeah, help you, you know, look at, look at as far as repertoire, finding bigger rep, you know, work on it with your, your coach and your um, teacher, look at roles that you may not be, you know, just give them a try, you know, even if it's in the comfort of your living room or, or a studio um, and see how they feel, even if it's not for public consumption for another 10 years. You could try things out and see what how they feel, you know. Thank you. Sure. Fantastic. Um, let's see. So we've got some other great questions. Um, I had a student ask me to ask you all. Um, how do you figure out what kind of roles are a good fit for you? I guess similar to what Emily was asked about and similar to what we've been talking about with repertoire, but how do you, how do you figure out what kind of roles are a good fit for you? What, what kind of programs and things? Wow. Well, <laughs> I, I will say that, <laughs> I will say that at least when it comes to Mozart, Reset roles, I think there is a progression. So if someone applies for my program and they don't have any rest experience, I'm not going to give them a Susanna or a Ferrando. Right. That's, we want to put singers in a position to succeed. So even with a tenor, even if they're not a character tenor per se, to dip their toe into those waters with a Curzio or a Basilio, even if that's not in their future, it's, it's a safe way. And same thing for a soprano, to start with a Barbarina or even a Giardina or Despina before tackling a Susanna. It's, I think it's really important to have those uh, as building blocks and you know, uh, instead of trying to tackle the top of the pyramid first. I agree with that. Oh, it, go ahead, go ahead. It's also a, a fuck question, you know, but you know, thinking young singers, should really be um, not only in tune with themselves, but take the advice of their mentors, you know, and starting small is always a very good idea. You know, uh, Barbarina is a great prelude to Susanna, for example. And as uh, Luke said, if you have no reset experience, then start with roles that are smaller and wretched until you can master that part of our craft. You know, um, and look, we all if, if you're involved in opera, you all know what big operas are and what smaller operas are, what the bigger composers did and Wagner and Verdi and what the, the composers like Mozart or maybe Donizetti or Rossini did. 
So choose wisely. Start small. You know, if you're if you are are um, doing well on on the small level and you have the temerity to move ahead and everything is good, then you move ahead in increments. Mm -hmm. You know, you should never stop start with with a role that's the the golden ring of 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 tenordom or soprano dom. You know, there's plenty of even though sopranos and tenors really have pretty much eponymous roles, you know, um, there are smaller things that Luke mentioned, Beppe or something like that. Of course, he even has a Lario, which is very nice. So there's no shame in starting small and getting great at what you do on the way. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic answer. Um, let's see. So Katie, this is an interesting one. So this is more this question is more for uh, you from your perspective. How do you pick seasons for yaps? Uh, that, that's a tricky one. And how do we pick rep, like what repertoire we're going to, what operas we're going to do for the season? I think, yeah, I think that's the idea. So um, our goal right now in Aspen, we've, we've shifted our, our mindset slightly to move towards ensemble aria, uh, ensemble operas in hopes that we don't have just one main singer carrying the entire opera. Right. This wasn't the best idea moving into a COVID summer where now there's a ton of ensemble singing and we're currently seriously stressing about how to get everyone to sing <laughs> safely 20 feet apart, not masked. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, to, that's, it's just a fun part of our day. But when it comes to um, what's best for our program, the, the belief was ensemble repertoire is, is going to better prepare all of our singers for what they have coming next. Um, so that's been, been our focus. And, um, and I think it gives, for us, it gives a lot more of our singers opportunities because singing a role is very important. Um, putting a role on your resume is important, but going through the process of preparing any role and being part of an ensemble and understanding what it is to go start to finish, be it, you know, Papagena or Pamina, that's a huge part of your training. Um, and so we want more singers to have that opportunity to go through that process. Um, so that's been, that's been our goal currently. Great. I, um, before we go on with other questions, I have now shared and I think it works. So click on the link in the chat. And that's just a few programs that you might not find a little off the beaten trail. Um, Luke's is on there. Um, and it's, it's just got some, some different, uh, oh gosh, I hit my piano. It's got some different programs. Um, and you'll see on there, there's, a, there's, you know, the cost. And so I had a student mention to me, you know, how do I pay for it all? And I think that that's a hard question. I hate to throw that at you three because that's such a hard one to answer. But what are what are some good uh, realistic, you know, ways to raise money for these gaps? You know, obviously we talked about what sets me apart in my application for funding and things. But you know, what are some what are some uh, interesting creative ideas for raising money for that? Did that mean raising money to pay for one's own tuition? I think, yeah, that, that's the idea. That's what I was going with. I mean, you know, because there's so many gaps. I, I feel like as a singer, you know, um, there's the gaps where you get really good and you're a post-grad and then you're in the programs that pay you or there's the ones that you have to pay for. So then if I'm in that level or if I'm just not super experienced yet, you know, and I'm trying to do these more accessible programs, how do I pay for it? What, what are some ways that I can raise money, benefit concerts, or what are some ways that you have found uh, students having success with? I'm gonna give some insider trading information, but don't, you know, don't call me out with all the admin people around the world. Um, so in Aspen, there's there's kind of two to three tiers. I would say for the, for the opera program, it is, highly unlikely that we would ask someone to pay full tuition. And if our number is written down in that spreadsheet, I'm, I'm not looking, I'm sure you have sticker shock. Um, it's not cheap. Um, but we have kind of these two levels of you can receive a fellowship, which will cover your tuition, your room and your board for the entire summer. There's very little out of your own pocket. Um, 
or we have a partial scholarship, partially you, what can you contribute? Um, so when you fill out a scholarship application for our program, and I know this is true across the board for other summer programs, first of all, people seem to think if you put all zeros in there that we think you must need lots of money. Your college students, we know you're poor. Right. Been there, we know you have no money. Um, so putting zeros just sounds like you're either not taking it seriously or you're hiding something. And we need to really know your financial situation to be able to consider how to best support you. Um, so my first recommendation is be super honest with anyone you're asking for support, be that the program itself or somebody else outside of it. Um, the best scholarship applications for us are when someone says, I can do a concert, I can do a fundraising concert and raise $500 and, and then my parents said they'll give me another $500 or they'll match whatever I make at the um, concert. And so if you can cover the rest of that, I can make this work, right? That I want to always write you a check if that's the case. Um, so that's my first recommendation. Uh, my second recommendation is you can appeal. Not everyone knows that. We've tried making it a little more. We don't want to just like write a note at the top of your um, admission letter. Like, by the way, you can ask more money because it doesn't really work like that. But we've tried making it a little more clear that if we give you an offer and you say, well, darn, I cannot make that work, then you can come back to us and say, I can't make that work, but Aspen's still my top choice. And, and again, be as honest as you can. You offer me $3,000, I need four. And then I can, I can get the rest if you can give me 4,000. So barter. That's my recommendation when it comes to that. Um, and I think everyone has become super entrepreneurial when it comes to finding, finding ways to use their talents um, and, and raise a little bit of money on their own. Because these programs are important and missing out of, on them, I think will, will take away from your overall training and you'll get behind. Um, for my programs, um... I keep costs down. I will charge you basically charge what you would pay to what you would pay a coach to coach a whole role. So I'm no frills. I'm I'm not offering yoga class in the morning, movement class, you know, to keep you busy from morning till night. But on the flip side, um, my tuition ranges from four hundred to a thousand total for the two weeks max. And to help singers afford that, I offer slow drip. <laughs> So I offered, we spread tuition out over as up to 12 months. So it could be 50 bucks a month, 50 or 60 bucks a month. Um, when I have in-person workshops, which will be starting in 2022, I do have, I uh, give singers scholarship if they're able to run subtitles on their off nights, because we do have subtitles for these shows. Um, obviously, uh, for this summer, there's no travel expenses, so there's no subtitles there. But... Um, in the past, singers have uh, participants have uh, applied for grants to cover tuition, and I'll give them a, a letter of acceptance, and they use that and they submit that to different organizations, and they get their their um, either you know either tuition covered or their um, travel expenses or their housing. Um, so, yeah, I should mention too, IU has some grants available. Um, I mean, the Joshi grant. If you're traveling to Europe, if you're doing like Luca, for example, or you're doing something else and you do have a reason um, that you're going to be overseas, there are grants you can apply through through IU uh, in addition to the Joshi one. So that's a really great point. And, and having a, a, an acceptance letter would be really, really helpful with that. Um, Professor Volpe, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, um, all, all of the young artist programs on all levels are going to try and work with students who apply. And we're going to try and give them as much financial aid as we can afford, for sure. Some programs are smaller than others and have certain budgets. So um, it, the goal, of course, is to earn your income with your artistry and your singing one day. And if you're not there yet, we don't expect you to be, of course, you're students. You know what I mean? So nobody is going to expect that you're going to be able to, you know, whip up six grand for a program between December and June singing. It's not going to happen, you know, and if it did, then you're not a student, then you should be out singing all the time, you know. However, if you can't, 
if if the financial situation for a lot of you is is dire and you don't have support from your parents or 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 very little or what they can afford which is very generous from anybody's parents if you're getting any money at all from your parents you're lucky but if you fall short you know there's no shame in in getting a job outside of your field you know we all have certain skills if you have a skill use it there's no shame in getting a job to support yourself while you're trying to become a professional singer you know any program we you know we're we're all going to work with you and try to give you as much money as we can to get you there and help you out you know but as miss sensone said earlier if you put zeros it's a little suspect you know be honest and as she said mentioned earlier it's a great way a very equitable way to make a relationship with a company i have this much money and i scraped it together you know if you could meet me a little bit and you if you're honest and you make a dialogue with us like that we're going to respond and try and help you as much as we can but in the meantime really you shouldn't expect to if you're uh, you know between 18 and 26 you shouldn't really expect to to create your income on singing you know i think it's really an un unrealistic um expectation maybe you'll get lucky and do you, you could do a concert here or there maybe you know pull a, pull a couple hundred bucks together but in the meantime you should not be idle meaning if you have free time there's all kinds of jobs and all kinds of ways you could make money beyond singing while you're young and there's no shame in that at all at all it yep. i think it builds integrity so really? go after what you want earn it go after it really excellent answers really excellent i mean that's i think that's one of the the hardest uh opponents we have right as singers in sure. college we're like how am i going to pay for this and that's right. a lot of times that's the thing keeping us from applying to these apps so I, I really appreciate those answers and i should mention it too this spreadsheet i put together is just ones that i found in the last couple of days that have still upcoming deadlines i didn't put aspen and luke on there um please drop your links in the in the chat um and i, I do have luke's on there because there are still some roles available uh, but these are just ones that are still upcoming and of course like we said the accessible programs a lot of times you know that they, they have a cost to them and and so we have to consider you know what we can do for that um Answer. yes Answer. we all want you to cross over that all important threshold from pay to sing to paid to sing we all want that for you but it takes time and you know it, it's a process to it there is yes um ron wanted me to ask um so when you're exit interviewing, this can be anybody, when you're exit interviewing for programs or, or getting surveys back or whatever that looks like, what are singers saying that they enjoy most about your program? I could throw one out. When I've, what I've read in the couple of years that I've been doing mine is they enjoyed the atmosphere, the, um, the personal attention they got. My program is only between 25 and 30 students so far. We try to keep it that way so we can give as much personal attention as we can. So the, the feedback on that has been great in that respect. They love the language aspect of it because they did, you know, a lot of a lot of Italian is performed. Uh, a lot of opera is performed in Italian. You know, of course, other languages as well, but a, a, a big part of it, and they felt that they benefited from that. The cultural experience of being in another country was very helpful to them. And I, I hear a lot of that, that they enjoyed it on top of the uh, tutelage they got. So for me, for, for Opera Luca, and that's what I've been seeing as feedback, reading those comments. Um, for mine, I would say that actually this coming summer, 70%, 70, 70 percent are repeat offenders. That's our singers that come back from multiple summers. That's great. So that in itself speaks. They're all my my family. I'm always happy, you know, when they flap their wings and move on to bigger programs such as Aspen or St. Louis, Santa Fe, you know, when the time comes. But you know, for I'm I'm here for them, and they all learn from each other. Um, outside world is brutal, um, especially in the opera world. So, so I, I offer an environment where is you're not only getting the one-on-one -on -one coaching, but also you're learning from each other as far as what works and what doesn't, even though all of our voices 
operate differently. <laughs> we, we all could learn it from each other, be it vocally, musically, and uh, the singers are always surprised how much they are stretched. Just in two weeks, you know, look back to our first couple days of teeth pulling and then like, wow, I just, just sang this whole role. And, and uh, camaraderie is, again, no voodoo doll, no pins. <laughs> We're all supportive of each other, so. Um, in, in Aspen, I, I would say one of the top pieces, I might ask Spencer to tag on what his experience was, but the, the lessons for us is big. So unlike most young artist programs at our level, you don't have weekly lessons, right? If you were in Santa Fe, you have four, five different teachers who pop in for a week or two, hear you, and then you have someone come the next week and tell you probably something totally different. Um, and so it's really important to have the caliber of teacher that we do, and then uh, to be able to work with those teachers every single week. And they're not just there for your lesson and then go disappear and, you know, go fishing or hiking in Aspen. They do that a little bit too, but they're super busy with you guys. They're going to your scenes programs. They're going to your um, concerts and additional performances. Um, and, and they're kind of giving you this constant feedback while you're in that experience of, you know, really delving into production from start to finish. Um, and the other piece is just the breadth of what you do in Aspen, orchestral, singing with orchestral, um, for orchestral pieces, concert repertoire, art song repertoire, um, musical theater, cabaret, you have opera scenes, you have a number of opera productions, you have singing in fancy houses in Aspen, that's always a good one. <laughs> I've never been invited, so Spencer, next time you're going to invite me to one. I hear they do nice wine. You haven't gone to any, any house concert? I've never been to a house concert. How I've been to the festival oh for God. years. I want to go to one of those. They're Are fun. Here? Yeah, if I can tack on to Katie's, you said I get to finish it. Um, the lessons are huge. The lessons are huge because a lot of programs they'll have lessons. Um, and, and that is probably, there's two things I'm going to say. The lessons, um, I actually started with my teacher, Carol Vaness, at Aspen before I got to IU. Um, and that was huge. Uh, the other thing I would say is the scenes program because like Katie was talking about, there are the two tiers. And so a lot of people think, oh, well, if I'm not, you know, the lead role of the opera, then I'm not going to do anything. And actually the last summer with, with Renee and Patrick taking over, there's going to be even more of that I hear. I mean, I understand, but even while I was there, every Saturday, there's a, a big giant scenes program with the whole town watching. So you get to do bits of, of different parts and scenes. And um, I got to be the quartet from Rigoletto both years, which was great. And so you get to do different different things. Um, so I would say the scenes and the, and the lessons were my two takeaways, but just so I get to have fun and, and tech on. Um, so I have another student question. Um, if a woman auditioning is pregnant, does it factor into the panel's decision or will it hinder an opportunity? I love that question. Can you guys hear my baby screaming in the background? <laughs> she's not a baby anymore. She's one and she walks and she calls everything dado. Um, but I think it's a consideration um, for sure, right? The question of when will you have said baby if, if you can tell that you are pregnant and, and when will you come back? Um, I will say we have a singer coming this summer who would have been pregnant and we did not know. They didn't share it with us. Um, she would have been pregnant last summer and she was international. And I was surprised and my immediate reaction was like, ooh, I wish I had known that. And then I realized I shouldn't have had that question because every individual artist should know their limitations and what they can handle. And in the world of being open and diverse, I would hope that most organizations are keeping an open mind to anything that's presented to them. That being said, if you are showing, you can follow up with your audition panelists and let them know where you are with that. If you feel comfortable, if that's what you wanna do, if you just wanna throw it all out on the table, I'm an overshare, so that would be the direction I went. Um, but you know, you can let them know, this is my due date, this is my plan. Um, when I spoke to the singer's manager and I said, well, she's going to need some time to recover. He's like, oh no, she has three weeks. And then that girl's back up on stage and she was. So, um, you know, everyone has kind of a different plan for after and, and it's helpful, I think, to share that. Um, 
And if someone is pregnant, congrats or planning, you'll never sleep again. So good luck. <laughs> yeah, enjoy your sleep while you have it. <laughs> yeah, exactly you don't well. appreciate it until it's been taken away, right, Catherine? <laughs> it's been forcibly removed. <laughs> a little forcibly bundle removed, of joy. That's a really good way. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, um, if there's no other answer to that one. Um, so we have a couple more questions. I, I don't want to uh, take everybody's time. Um, I want to be, be considerate of people's time. So just to recap, and if you have to leave, um, feel free to leave. Maybe we'll go another five minutes, try to get these last two questions in that I just got. Um, but in, in the chat, we have um, a link to Aspen's website. Um, Opera Luca, you can definitely find by just uh, searching Opera Luca on Google. Uh, we have Joni Sherrod, who works with me in the Office of Entrepreneurship and Career Development. She shared links to funding options that the school does have available at IU. Um, and then we also have that Google Doc. And that just has 10 um, young artist programs that I found that are, a lot of them are happening virtually, but they are happening this year that you can apply to. Um, so really, really quick, let's see if we can fit these last two questions in. Joseph, did you want to come on and ask your question? Sure. Hello. Um, full disclosure, um, I'm not an IU student, but I heard about the um, conference from my friend Hunter Shainer, um, who studied with Carol Van Ness. Um, we know each other from our undergrad. Um, I'm currently a grad student at Boston Conservatory, and I'm a countertenor. So I was wondering um, how I should go about building my resume with performed roles as I begin applying for higher tier YAPs. Because I've noticed that some direct directors may not consider counter tenors for like opera ensembles, and many companies are producing shows with counter tenor roles. Um, also, I'm I have been learning pantsera arias, so I know I'm I'm very open to performing those kind of roles when um, directors do consider that. So, if any of you could answer that question, that would be great. Well, I guess I'm outside the box a little bit because in the past I've had a countertenor Hansel and a countertenor Carabino so <laughs> it's a little different but you know I would say look for you know there'll be some yaps I would I would think that offer some handle not in my program per se but I'm sure there there'll be some um Peter or Catherine what do you think I you know I I would be thrilled to have a counter tenor come to Italy there's plenty to do and if I had one that or two or any that would apply to my program and get in I would design things for them mm -hmm. you know or certainly have Shana's or something to do if I couldn't produce a full opera I think it's a an underappreciated voice type and um, I would just encourage you wherever you are to just push ahead and do everything you can do even if it is introducing yourself into Mozart trouser roles why not today is today and I think we need to be open to all kinds of possibilities and if it's something you can do do it you know I don't think you really need to have a formulaic way of uh, building your resume anything that you can get on your resume shows us experience and the tenacity you have to go after something put your heart in it and follow it yeah, Joseph, we're actually doing Rhoda Linda this summer. Um, and so we're in the counter tenor world. And um, so first of all, keep keep a really close eye on what programs are doing something and make sure your application is in because I'll tell you, we had two options for counter tenors that we were really aware of um, from just our connections and um, and so we'll always be happy to have more. And I agree with Peter that um, in the past, we've had a handful of counter tenors that again, we don't have work for them, but we have in the operas, but we have our weekly scenes programs and we are always very interested in bringing them here. And then one of the singers that we were considering for, um, for this summer in Rotolinda was a singer that has been with us. I think he came three or four different years at least Mm -hmm. Spencer, there when Jake was there? He's been there before me, and yeah, he was, I think he did the program three times, maybe four times? Yeah. Four times, is that right? And so he was one of our first phone calls, just because he'd been with us, and then we said, we have this repertoire, and, and when we talked, to, when Renee brought up Rodolinda, the first thing we all said was, we have Jake, right, because he'd been with us for years. So I think 
a lot of what you're going to have to do is build relationships with places that um, want to back your training. And then they're going to continue to give you more work. And when someone's looking at your resume, they're not going to say, well, why haven't they done stuff all over the place? Or why did they only sing in this one place? We get it. You're a counter tenor. You found your money spot and you should stay there and get all of the experience you can. So. Okay. I'm going to fit this last question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Joseph. I was, just, I was just saying, thank you. That's good to hear all that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for joining the call. Hunter's a great friend of mine. Okay. There is one last question I'd love to fit in. If you have to leave, please leave. I'm, I don't want to take up your time. Um, it was a student asking, um, so there's a talented candidate for your program. Um, is it more attractive that they've done a small part in a famous program or a big school or something, or that they've done a leading role in a program you haven't heard of? Hmm. I can answer that only from my, my standpoint. I don't I don't think that would pray, play a role in whether I would want to accept that particular person in, or the particular singer into a program. I don't, you know, previous experience, I'm not a professional company, me. My, I, I run a smaller one, you know, but um, for me, I, I don't really look at, I take a glance at experience, you know, but I listen more to the vocal material and their desire for, let's say, I do, I, my program is a bit more specific. It's designed around bel canto, uh, Italian opera. So if there's some, if these voices that come to me are really interested in that type of rep, and I hear that they are through their singing, I'm interested in that rather than what kind of experience they have or could bring to this program that I'm involved in, mine personally. You know, so really, when I look at applicants for Opera Luca, I don't really, I wouldn't say, well, this person, well, wow, this person already did me me somewhere, uh, rather than they only were able to do the, uh, the Buona Donna from Act 3 in a major program. It, this, for me, doesn't play a role, for me, personally. Yeah, for me, I think it's basically, basically a wash. Um, they kind of equal each other out. Although I would say if I'm casting a Rusalka, which is a big sing, again, I think I would want to see some experience or even a Donna Anna or Elvira to have some experience as far as previous uh, you know, tackling of mid-sized to larger roles instead of, again, just a one-liner. Um, which sometimes I know it's difficult to, everyone, we all, all the roles need to be filled, but again, we need to work away at the ladder as far as size of roles. Yeah, I'd say for Aspen, it'll depend on if you're being considered as a Fleming artist, right? So if, if you think about maybe even three tiers, if you think about Aspen studio artist level, Fleming artist, and then next step, um, possibly a Santa Fe or um, an HGO young artist program or Lindemann or something like that. Um, you know, for studio artists, we're just looking at what your experience is. Again, kind of that answer from before of your resume doesn't matter as much as your potential. Your current talent is, is gonna be clear with your audition, but it's more about the potential and where you can go and, and what we can, I think Peter and Luke have both said this, you know, what we can do with that voice for the future. Um, for Fleming artists, it's looking for experience. As I had said, we look for someone who's sung a complete role. And so if you've done it at a university with a very small music program, or you've done it um, at you know St. Louis, that's not as important to us as the experience of working through. But I would say if, if for a Fleming artist, we've never heard of the majority of the stuff on your resume, then we don't know at what level you've done the work, if that makes sense. If we don't know who the coaches were or who the conductor was or who the stage director was. That's again, why that section at the bottom of your resume that lists that out is really helpful. If we can see, well, you've worked with Luke and you've worked with Peter, right? Then we say, okay, well, we can, we can put our stamp on that and we feel comfortable. But if we don't know any of the names, I, I would say that'd be um, a little more difficult to evaluate your level compared to others. For, you know, next step young artist programs, they're gonna wanna see that you've done things with um, slightly larger houses or done programs 
um, like Luke's and Peter's, like Aspen, um, you know, St. Louis is a great program to do if you can get yourself Moline, yeah. there in preparation for something like the Lindemann program, for example, you know. So, um, so I think that again, three levels depending on where you are. Well, um, I would love to keep going and going and going. I could go for another couple hours because I love talking apps and we have wonderful um, panelists. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, this was really, really great. I think everyone learned a lot. Um, we have links, we have uh, resources to find all three of your programs. Um, I encourage everyone to, to look into those and, and just see what, what works for you. I will be requesting, um, I should have mentioned at the beginning, we do have operas, go, uh, uh, rehearsals going on right now for Turn of the Screw. Um, so there's a lot of people who couldn't make it for that reason. Um, so I'm gonna be asking the voice department to send this recording out. We have, uh, the meeting has been recorded. So there will be many more students to view uh, this great work. So thank you so much for, for coming. Thank you for uh, all of our participants. And um, if anyone has any questions for me or for the office, please email me um, and we'll be happy to be in touch. But just thank you all so much. Well, and, um, okay. everybody, feel free to email me as well. I'm happy to um, answer additional questions. If this left you thirsty for more, go ahead and uh, send an email over to my Aspen email address. It's on the website and happy to talk more about this, even if it's not Aspen specific. Likewise, Likewise we continue to be available to you all. Yep, just find me on Facebook or my website. I'm easily accessible. <laughs> Well, thank you all. Everyone have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night.